particular topic tonight, basically going to talk to us about um, astronomy, I guess, present and future in Australia. And um, <coughs> you didn't know, Fred is the Australian government astronomer at large, and he can explain to us what that means. <laughs> so Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, happy to explain that. If, um, if I sound incoher incoherent tonight, Niven forced me to have a glass of wine, that's why. <coughs> I absolutely twisted my arm. You do have wine. It was. <laughs> it was a very nice one too, so forgive me if I put this up. Let's just check. Um, okay, so there should be a test card there, there is. And somewhere there should be my presenter, which I've put down and probably forgotten what I've done with it. Here it is in my pocket. <laughs> I blame Niven, honestly, I do blame him solidly. So, um, right, change spectacles. You get to a certain age, ladies and gentlemen, where one pair of spectacles is not enough. You need at least two, sometimes simultaneously. So, um, forget that. So this is uh, indeed, exactly as Bill said, I want to talk to you about Australian astronomy. Uh, so I'm taking you to Australia for a little while, but then we're going to be in the rest of the universe. Uh, because uh, the things that I do are taking us far and wide, uh, not as far as you might think, but uh, certainly above the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, a lovely portrait of the of, uh, five of the telescopes of the Compact Array at uh, Narrabri in northwestern New South Wales. For my dark skies down under uh, topic, and uh, it's really 2020s and 2030s, maybe even up to 2050s, depending on how optimistic you feel. Uh, but what I really want to talk to you about is what keeps me awake at night. Uh, and um, there are a number of things that do that, and we'll get to them in due course. As you've heard, my job is the Australian government's astronomer at large, because they haven't found out yet. Uh, and that is a position within the Department of Industry, Science and Resources. As I mentioned on Friday night, uh, that department consists of 3,000 bureaucrats and one astronomer. And so my, part of my job is advising the government on things like the stuff I'm going to talk about. As well as um, having a good time uh, with outreach events on radio and TV and a podcast called Space Nuts, which seems to have reached New Zealand as well. Uh, I don't have much street cred within the Department of Industry, but I do in some of the universities who seem to be glad to have me as well. So I... Uh, acknowledge them. Uh, is this all going through? Okay, cool. I've got a thumbs up. So let's kick off because what I want to uh, start with, as always, is an acknowledgement to First Nations people uh, throughout the world. Uh, of course, in my case, it's the uh, Guringai people of Northern Sydney, where I live. Uh, I always take pains to recognise the fact that certainly in Australian Aboriginal tradition, and I know in Maori tradition as well, there's that close connection between country and sky. Uh, which is very important to us astronomers as well as uh, First Nations people uh, of our countries. This is a lovely portrait of the emu in the sky uh, done by Carl Piquet uh, for actually for our observatory in Western Australia. And I'm sure you are all familiar with the emu in the sky, but I'm going to show you anyway. Uh, formed by the dust clouds in the Milky Way. Um, and we see the head of the emu uh, by right next to the Southern Cross and its body stretching and uh, neck stretching down through Scorpius and to the richness of the galactic center. This picture uh, by um, Akira Fuji, who sadly passed away quite recently. So um, yes, uh, we see the, the emu um, on a dark site. The emu is unforgettable when it's rising uh, in May evenings. It's something that takes your breath away. It's eaten the galactic cube. Yes, the Galactic Kiwi is... is yes, yes, okay. That's nice to know. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, it's, it's nice to know because I'm really interested in how, how everybody sees the sky because nobody, none of us see it the same way. Um, let me show you another picture of the Milky Way, uh, taken this time from uh, a lighthouse, uh, Baron Joy Lighthouse, which is actually quite close to where I live uh, in the Northern Beaches. It's not... Um, my photograph. This is one of the prize winners of the David Merlin Awards, David Merlin being 
a very well-known uh, astrophotographer, particularly in the 70s and 80s when he first put colour into the stars by using colour filters on the Anglo-Australian telescope. A good friend of mine lives nearby and we do a lot together. Uh, but I show this picture because it does show there's no jiggery-pokery with this image. This is taken on the northern fringes of Sydney and you can still see the Milky Way if you do good sky subtraction with your images. But it's just the background for a slide that really explains why Australia and New Zealand actually by inference because we're in the same part of the world why we have such a, a, a wonderful vantage point on the universe and you don't need me to tell you that our southern latitude gives us access to some of the most extraordinary objects in the in the sky the galactic center the two nearest dwarf galaxies uh, of any size uh, the best and biggest two globular clusters in the sky and the list goes on uh, so we have that advantage in latitude, as do you, and you also share this uh, advantage. We, we are in, in, the, in the longitude gap between southern Africa and South America. So if you want coverage of processes going on in the universe uh, that are of interest, for example, an exploding star and the way it's light, then falls away in a supernova explosion and its aftermath, what you need is continuous com coverage. And in the southern hemisphere, Australia and, by inference, again, New Zealand, uh, your, our two countries are basically in the same part of the world, so we both share that. Um, maybe we've got a slight edge on you in this, uh, in the sense that some parts of Australia do have really stable atmospheric conditions. I'll say a bit more about this in a minute, uh, but it's something that gives uh, astronomers a lot of well, pleasure and satisfaction in particular when you've got this stable atmosphere that stops the stars from twinkling. Twinkling's lovely and romantic and all the rest of it, but it absolutely messes up our imaging and is the last thing we need. Um, dark skies, and of course you are leading the world in this, which is fantastic, and we are following on behind with much admiration. We have three uh, IDA-recognized dark sky parks in Australia. Uh, the first one was the one I and my partner Marnie uh, and many helpers put together for the Warrumbungle National Park, which is where our National Observatory is. Um, we also have, arguably, the most radio quiet site on the planet. Um, there, there are places where th there's not much radio interference elsewhere, but I think we actually hit the spot uh, with uh, the observatory in Western Australia, which I'm going to take you to very soon. Uh, so let me start, though, by talking about a little bit of history. Um, historically, Australian astronomy has done extremely well in the radio field. In fact, after the Second World War, when scientists first started realizing that you could use all this surplus radar equipment uh, and turn it into uh, astronomical uh, telescopes, uh, Australia was one of three countries leading the world, the other two being the UK and the Netherlands. So as I've said there, our facilities have produced outstanding science, extraordinary technical spin-offs, think Wi-Fi, that came from an Australian radio astronomer, uh, um, and, you know, and it was developed by CSIRO, which actually runs this telescope, the Parkes Dish. Uh, regional benefits, and in radio astronomy, I guess the Parkes Dish, which is also called Murray Yang in the uh, Wiradjuri language, uh, was built in 1961, and is still doing fantastic work. And I always think it's one of the most beautiful uh, telescope sites in the world. It kind of looks as though it's grown there, really. It just sort of appears in the landscape. Um, that focus has now shifted to Western Australia, even though we still have operating telescopes in the east, um, because our future centers on the International Square Kilometer Array. Uh, we have a low frequency facility for that telescope being built at what is now known not just as the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory, but also in Yarimane Ilgari Bundara, which is uh, Wajiri for sharing sky and stars. That's the name of the observatory. It's a bit of a mouthful, but we use it with pride. So that site uh, is where there are already radio telescopes, but this extraordinary machine with all these antennas uh, will be the future of actually not just Australian, but international radio astronomy. It takes a bit of believing that this is actually a telescope, but it is. 
Uh, it masquerades as a bunch of Christmas trees and in fact um, quite often at Christmas time they get decorated. Not all of them because there are going to be 131,000 of them in a 65 uh, kilometre area. Um, I put frequencies in here just because I'm pedantic. Uh, that's the low frequency end of the radio spectrum uh, when it comes to astronomical observations. The mid-frequency telescopes, you might know where they are. They're actually in the High Karoo in South Africa. Um, they, they, they are conventional dishes. There's going to be nearly 200 of them uh, forming the mid-frequency element of the square kilometre array where the low frequency end. And it turns out that that's actually the really interesting bit. Um, if you want to know why uh, these Christmas trees look like they do, um, think about you know the common TV aerial on the top of somebody's house and then think about it standing on end pointing upwards uh, and think about it in three dimensions rather than just two and that's what you've got. These are simply what we call dipole aerials, the standard thing that you would use for VHF signals but they're pointing upwards and all the steering of this telescope is done electronically. You don't point anything around, you do it all with the, uh, with the software and the electronics. So to um, somebody like me, my background is optical astronomy, as you'll see in a minute. Um, but the, uh, so this is like magic to an optical astronomer, uh, the fact that you can move your telescope around without actually moving anything. Uh, but it, is, it comes at the expense of a huge amount of uh, you know, necessary software, for example, and data processing. So in fact, the data rate will be greater when this telescope is finished than today's global internet tra traffic in total. So it's telling you that we're still waiting for the computers that will actually operate this telescope when it starts operating in 2028. And it's legislated to be radio quiet. There's um, seven layers of legislated protection that keep this site very, very quiet from the radio perspective. In other words, no mobile phones. Forget your microwave ovens. All of the above, uh, it, it's uh, prohibited. And so we don't have uh, any what's called RFI, radio frequency interference. And that protection goes almost to the coast. I, I didn't put a map up. This is in inland Western Australia. Let's move uh, just to see what's there now. Uh, these are some of the dishes of what's called ASCAP, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, which is one of two precursors for the Square Kilometre Array. Uh, and they're already doing fantastic research. They've been operating for more than 10 years. Um, as I've said there, they, they, they actually cover a, a mid-frequency. They're akin to the telescopes in South Africa. 36 antennas, and it's a pathfinder. It's a, a telescope designed to show what the square kilometre array could do, even though when this was built, um, it turned out to be different from what we're seeing. It doesn't look anything like Christmas trees, as I'm sure you've noticed. Um, they're called, they're equipped with what they're called phase array feeds, which are at the focus of the telescope. And you probably get the idea, it's like a, a radio uh, image sensor, a bit like the CCDs uh, and other devices that some of you use for astrophotography. These are the same, but they're used for radio, uh, radio frequency research. Uh, and as I've said there, they're playing a starring role in FRB research. Who knows what FRBs are? Thank you. That's not the way to say it. A radio announcer once told me, you can't say fast radio burst. You've got to say fast radio burst. So that's what we do. <laughs> um, because they are fast, a millisecond long, typically. Um, there was a paper came out a couple of weeks ago, led by one of my friends and colleagues, Stuart Ryder, which uh, had the most distant of these events. It was a burst of radio radiation that came from uh, the depths of the universe, set off on its journey eight billion years ago and was reached, uh, received by this telescope and demonstrated to be at that distance of 8 billion light years. So this is kind of the future, or, or well, this is the present, but what I just showed you was the future. Um, I want to turn now, though, to something that's closer to home for me, uh, and that is optical astronomy, visible light astronomy. Uh, this, with this picture of the Siding Spring Observatory in northwestern New South Wales, about, um, it's about five hours drive from Sydney. Uh, that dome contains Australia's largest visible light telescope, uh, the Anglo-Australian telescope with a 3.9 metre mirror. Uh, it's still producing world-class science. 
And I'm not just saying that because I was its astronomer in charge for 20 years. And that's why I'm now the astronomer at large. Somebody realized that to get my new job title, they'd only have to change four letters on the office door, which is what happened, basically. <laughs> um, I always tell people that I worked for so many years in that building that I actually started to look like it. Uh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Uh, the telescope inside there, as I've said, in Gamilla Ray country, Warren Bungle, the name of the mountains behind, is a Gamilla Ray world meeting crooked mountains. Uh, and it absolutely perfectly describes the landscape. So inside that dome is this telescope, uh, which uh, actually has a fairly famous person in the background there. I don't know whether you can see him. Um, young Brian Cox here, who um, I did a, uh, was fortunate to do a stargazing live from the telescope a couple of times in 2017 and 2018. Uh, so he's looking on the telescope with suitable admiration because it is a fabulous telescope. Um, it's now operated by the Australian National University. It used to be the Australian government, uh, but it's switched to the university now, but it's still owned by the Commonwealth of Australia, which means um, one day I'm going to figure out what, to have, what we're going to do with it when it stops being paid for by the ANU. Uh, that actually is something that keeps me awake at night, but it's only one of the minor things that does. Uh, and just to tie up the loose end there, um, its dark skies are protected by state legislation up to 200 kilometres or so. So just like the radio facilities, we have legislation that stops people building football fields down at the bottom of the mountain or putting radio transmitters right next to the square kilometre array. The telescope's got a, I think, a, well, you know, I could talk forever about this telescope because I ran it for 20 years. But let me just very briefly, because I love this stuff, show you uh, what it was like when it was being built. Um, it was an extraordinary machine. Uh, it was planned in the mid-1960s. By 1967, a bunch of Australian and British scientists, because it's a joint project, had gone to the glassworks of Owens, Illinois, which surprisingly is in Illinois, uh, in the United States, where this new material called Servit was being developed, a, a, a glass ceramic material for telescope mirrors. And there's a lump of it, which is very hot, with four anonymous people from our technical committee looking through it. I've always wondered what they might have been saying, um, because I don't think they would see much through that, actually. But the thing that I love about this picture is the guy at the back there. Uh, <laughs> and all he had to do was walk forward and just prod, prod it on because this thing's white hot. Anyway, I don't know what happened to him. Um, that mirror was eventually cast in 1969. Um, and this image shows the, the, the block of material that was later to become the Anglo-Australian telescope mirror. 3.9 meters in diameter, weighs 16 tons. Uh, with four people who are very important in my life, uh, or were, particularly one of them, uh, the gentleman on the left uh, with his, his lovely hand on hip pose, which was very typical, he was my boss for two years because um, he was the um, optical director of the company that were grinding and polishing this telescope mirror, Grub Parsons in the United Kingdom, and I started my career working for them uh, before I went back to uni to do a master's. Uh, next to him is Roderick uh, Redman, who was the director of the Cambridge Observatories. Next to him, uh, with the bow tie, anybody recognise him? He's a Kiwi, and you ought to be incredibly proud of him. <laughs> it's Ben Gascoigne. Uh, he was a Kiwi-born astronomer, uh, spent his career mostly working at the Australian National University. There's a long story, uh, which I haven't time to relate now. I. A couple of years ago, I was asked by, it's actually three years ago, I was asked by the Australian Academy to write his biography. Uh, and I'm still doing it. It's a long job. Uh, but it's great uh, to be here in what was his hometown. He was raised, was actually born in Napier, but raised here in Auckland. Uh, went to, um, uh, let me get it right, Ruriema? No, I can't say it. Prime, primary school. Say it for me. That's the one. Thank you. Thank you, Niven. Remuera, that's it. I knew, a, I knew there was a U in it. Um, and Auckland Grammar School. And um, did his PhD in, in Bristol. But he became uh, a very noted astronomer. He actually doubled up the, the size of the known universe in the 1950s when he realized that our understanding of the standard candles that we use in astronomy, what are called Cepheid variable stars, 
we had it wrong. They were, they were intrinsically brighter than we thought they were. And he also was project scientist for the Anglo-Australian Telescope. So what I'm going to do um, when I finish this damn biography is send it to you so you'll know what a great achiever you had among <laughs> your country people uh, from, or confederates from, uh, from Auckland. And on the right, somebody else I worked with at the Royal Greenwich Observatory, John Pope, who was an engineer. So they were all there uh, chatting about the mirror. Um, and then that mirror was sent to Newcastle on Tyne, where this uh, person, another old friend of mine, sadly passed away in 2004. He was the optical uh, manager of the shop that ground and polished that mirror. And because he was the boss, he's allowed to put his fingerprints on the mirror surface there. Um, David Sindon, uh, a great and um, entertaining uh, a great engineer and an entertaining friend. Um, the telescope was actually the first in the world to be computer controlled. The first big telescope uh, that was completely computer controlled. Uh, this is a young night assistant by the name of Robert Dean uh, at the controls back in 1974. And it has to be said that the computers have aged rather better than the staff have, because that's Robert now. Uh, but um, he um, He's retired, in fact, now as Rob, but one of the stalwarts of the observatory. And uh, I thought that pair of photographs tells the story perfectly. So um, let me, though, move on from history to uh, the present era, because there is an issue with Siding Spring Observatory. Um, and even though its dark skies are really dark, uh, we actually got gold tier status with the Warren Bungle Dark Sky Park when it was when it was finally recognized by the IDA. Uh, even though we have very dark skies, what we don't have is this exquisite stability that you get in just a few parts of the world. Uh, places where the atmosphere blows over an ocean uh, and the, the, what we, what we get what's called laminar flow, a very smooth flow of air, before it rises up to a mountain top, perhaps 3,000 meters high, and then gives you this exquisite what we call seeing, that freedom from turbulence that means your star images are stars rather than fuzzy blobs uh, as we get at Siding Spring. And so um, Australia's astronomers now have access to a site which is uh, blessed with exactly those conditions because of the Australian government. See, I've got to wave the flag for the Australian <laughs> government because they pay my salary. Uh, but it's a great partnership, uh, this strategic partnership with the European Southern Observatory uh, which actually operates these telescopes at a place called Cerro Paranal in northern Chile. That partnership was brokered in 2017. It goes for 10 years. And so, as I've said there, it gives Australian astronomers access to the world's finest southern hemisphere telescopes on the finest southern hemisphere site. And I'm sure you all know that collectively those four enclosures contain 8.2 metre telescopes, which are known collectively as the VLT, the Very Large Telescope. Uh, rather than Il Grande Telescopio Galileo or something like that, which you'd expect the Europeans to, to do, but they don't. Um, so that is the state of the art for today's uh, visible light astronomers in Australia. They have access to these marvellous instruments and they're doing extraordinary work. And in fact, that fast radio burst that I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, the reason we know it's at 8 billion light years away is because one of these telescopes was used to follow up where the radio burst came from and discover that it was from a pair of galaxies actually at 8 billion light years away which were interacting and probably what these things are, nobody knows what fast causes fast radio bursts but the thinking is that they are um, storms basically or flares on what are called magnetars, which are very, very compact stars, maybe a few kilometers in diameter, nearly dropped it then, uh, and uh, with high, high magnetic fields, highly magnetic uh, neutron stars, in fact, to boil it down. Um, so th this is the kind of research that our astronomers are doing, and they're using all these marvelous facilities. Now, with an eye to the future, uh, what the European Southern Observatory is doing is building this. Uh, this is a mountain top not very far from Cerro Paranal. It's called Cerro Amazones. And this is an artist's impression of uh, an instrument called the Extremely Large Telescope, the ELT. Uh, and it's, um, as I said, it's now under construction. So we are hoping that, yes, Australian astronomers will have access to that if we can persuade the Australian government 
uh, to, to basically join the institution, the European Southern Observatory. Uh, I'll come to that, back to that in a minute. Uh, but this uh, facility has extraordinary capabilities. Uh, it has a mirror which is 39.3 metres in diameter. That's 10 times the Anglo-Australian telescope mirror's diameter. Moreover, this is not pie in the sky because this is currently under construction. This was what the site looked like a year ago, just over a year ago. Uh, back in June, it looked like that uh, with, as you can see, some very large cranes. Here's a standard sized car giving you some idea of the scale that we're talking about. And at the beginning of last month, a couple of light pollution pictures there just to upset all the astronomers on the other mountain top. But you get the idea of how enormous this thing is going to be. Um, this is the sort of crane that you use in, a, in skyscrapers here in Auckland. But it's actually on the inside of the building here rather than uh, on the outside. So that is where the attention of optical astronomers throughout the world is being focused except perhaps in the USA, that's a different story which I have time to talk about tonight and we do have an involvement with that but for Australian astronomers their aspirations are very much in the direction of this telescope and if I can just digress for a minute um, here's a picture that I showed on Friday night of a mock-up of the James Webb telescope with its uh, 18 segment 6.5 meter diameter mirror largest space telescope ever built 10 billion dollars to cost uh, 10 billion dollars cost to build and launch um, the equivalent picture of a mock-up uh, well something's being built because this picture was taken before the James Webb was finished and launched the equivalent for the extremely large telescope is this um, and that's what the mirror is going to look like except it won't be bits of cardboard it will be highly reflective pieces 798 of them and that will give you the 39.3 meter diameter mirror. You can see that the hole in the middle is actually big enough to drop the whole JWST through. And it's the only, the, the only way you can do this kind of science is from the ground. And what it will do is, of course, gather light from very, very faint objects. Its diameter will give very high resolution, fineness to detail. It will see detail 20 times finer than the Hubble Space Telescope. And in case you're thinking, how can you do that from a telescope on the ground where it's got to look through the atmosphere, the European Southern Observatory have effectively perfected um, uh, something called multi-conjugate adaptive optics, which is a way of correcting for the turbulence in the atmosphere. I always say it's akin to noise cancelling headphones, where you cancel the noise uh, by putting an opposite signal in it. You do the same sort of thing with, uh, with optics for this multi-conjugate adaptive optic system. So that is an extraordinary telescope and it's not very far from completion. It is halfway through its build. Uh, so 2028 we will see first light. Just one thing to notice though, I don't know whether you've noticed this number up here, uh, it's a sixth of the cost of the web telescope. So for one web you can build six of these and um, that would be pretty neat if we could do that. The, the bottom line is though that astronomy is not funded at the level that space astronomy is and there's all kinds of reason for that. Uh, 1.59 billion US dollars is a lot of money for ground-based astronomy. So what's going to do? Well all these facilities basically will let the Australia, astronomers of Australia and, and I, I, I would you know, probably on behalf of my colleagues I could extend that to your country because we have many collaborations across the Tasman Sea um, and yeah it lets us explore the whole history of the universe that strange looking graphic there is meant to show the Big Bang on the left and today on the right with a lot of hodgepodge in between I'm not going to spend the details on it but it will be essentially uh, the, the, the realm of these facilities will go from the dark ages before the first stars lit to today's galaxies. So the kinds of things, for example, that the Square Kilometre Array will do, uh, the Square Kilometre Array will be able to look at the cold hydrogen uh, that was present in the universe after the Big Bang and before the first stars formed, exactly what I've said there, the dark ages. Uh, so it will not only be able to detect that cold hydrogen, which is extremely difficult, but it will be able to map it. We'll be able to show where that hydrogen was in the baby universe, 
uh, at a time perhaps 13.1, 13.2, 13.3 billion years ago. Uh, people are interested in the origin of magnetism in the universe. Where did the magnetic fields come from that we find everywhere? And, and we are realizing how, how important these things are. Um, studies of the evolution of galaxies. This, of course, is a cartoon galaxy that I'm showing you here. Uh, but we want to know what drives galaxies, what's different about the way galaxies form in clusters or not in clusters. All of that comes out of the research that can be done by things like the Extremely Large Telescope. And of course, coming nearer to our own time, uh, we're interested in the planets of other stars <clears throat> and whether they might house interesting chemicals that might have prebiotic molecules in them or even biomarkers, biomarkers being things that can only be generated by living organisms. It's actually very difficult to, to be categorical about biomarkers, but uh, some things that you would find in the atmosphere of a planet would speak of there being life on the surface of that planet. In fact, if you looked at the Earth, uh, methane and oxygen are completely out of balance in the Earth's atmosphere, and they are symptomatic of the fact that we have life processes here. Um, Looking further afield, maybe technomarkers, which will be uh, things that demonstrate that technical uh, ability has been developed on the surface of a planet. For example, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, which are an industrial pollutant that we've tried very hard to get rid of uh, because they're damaging to the ozone layer. They can only be uh, produced by industrial processes. They don't occur in nature. So if you find those in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, uh, then you know that your inhabitants or the, their inhabitants are trashing their planet just like we trashed ours. Um, which is not actually one of the things that keeps me awake at night. Um, but the, the, the two things that do, uh, and this is kind of the rest of the talk, I think. So uh, it, I, it, I, it won't be depressing, I promise you. Uh, there's a happy ending, kind of, kind of happy ending. We're working towards it. So one of them is back to this. So what happens if we don't manage to persuade the cabinet of the Commonwealth of Australia? It's not just the science minister, it's the cabinet and the prime minister that needs to know uh, that this is a great thing because it is very expensive. Um, as long as it doesn't go beyond these four walls, I can tell you how expensive it is. Uh, $500 million, which is enough to buy hospitals, schools, universities, you know, you're talking about an enormous sum of money. It's over 10 years. Uh, we have a joining fee and we have uh, an, an annual subscription and it comes to about half a billion for 10 years. Now, if I had to give bets on whether we'll get that, I think 50-50 might be optimistic um, and it would depend. Um, but uh, we're working very hard to make a case for this money uh, to be at least budgeted and allocated uh, because it's important that we join with uh, the international community in a, in a venture like this. So the trouble is if we don't join, that strategic partnership winds up in 2027, the year before this telescope will be completed and we don't have anything. It puts Australian optical astronomy back 50 years to the, the time when the AAT was built. So it's really rather crucial that we get that, because if we don't, you can wave goodbye to the Australian flag um, and uh, we'll be back to this other level, um, which is a cartoon from my kid's book recently. I got the old pens out and did some sketches and then somebody from the publishers animated them. But that's, um, that's our cat muscat, by the way, just in case you wondered. Uh, yeah, so we'll be at that level, not quite that level, but you get the drift. We'll be uh, in a very unfortunate position. So uh, we are working hard, as I said, to build a case for uh, optical astronomy to take this path with the European Southern Observatory. The other thing that keeps me awake is something that might keep you awake as well. Uh, and it's a much broader issue. Uh, and that is this. Um, the uh, influence or the effect of the mega constellations that we are getting in our skies. This snapshot taken actually uh, uh, quite a while ago because I couldn't download it last night when I tried to, uh, the new version, um, that's of the Starlink satellites currently in orbit. In fact at that time 
There were 5,126. 5, it's now more than 5,300 uh, because of the launches since then. But you can see they are everywhere in our skies, in our gardens, everywhere. Um, so this is an issue that, of course, you can't solve by terrestrial legislation. It's fine having an observatory uh, like the square kilometer, like in Yarimana, Bundara, Ilgari, protected by uh, legislation or Siding Spring Observatory if you've got stuff going on in the sky. And so, as I said, despite all this legislated protection, Australian astronomers share the global challenge of interference from satellite constellations. Um, and that's really something that affects everybody, not just astronomers. Uh, it affects, you know, casual sky watchers, it affects amateur astronomers, First Nations traditions, all of that is affected by this phenomenon. Just to recap on something that most of you will know already, why are satellites bright? Uh, and it's because uh, they are orbiting, uh, you know, several hundred kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Here's the observer, one of you or me, in darkness because the Earth has carried them into the night side of the Earth, but the satellite's still in sunshine. And so uh, we see that satellite brightly illuminated. They don't have lights of their own, uh, they are just illuminated by sunlight. But there is another aspect of these, and that is uh, that they're always bright in the radio sky. So for radio emissions, that happens night or day. And so radio astronomers are in many ways in a worse position than we in the business of optical astronomy. This diagram is now out of date, in fact. Uh, so what it shows is uh, launches of spacecraft more than 100 kilograms. So that rules out CubeSats, which are about 3,000 in number. Uh, but you can see there we've got uh, blue stuff, which is other. That's everything that's not Starlink. The orange is Starlink, kicked in in May 2019 and has been climbing steadily since. And in fact, uh, if we plotted this diagram today, you can see it stops at the beginning of 2023, but it would reach the top here. Uh, but if you plotted that, and it would be mostly orange. Um, said there are more than 3,300 in operation at that time. It's now, as I said, 5,300. So it's gone up by uh, quite a large amount. Um, so just the history of this. Back in May was when the astronomical world was taken by surprise by the first tranche of Starlink satellites. It's now, as I said, 5,302. 11,908 is the number that have planned um, uh, launch capabilities within or facilities within the next uh, few years. So that was the, those data relate to the day before yesterday. Uh, but there is a generation two that's been planned and approved, which would add another 30,000. Um, so they are launched, as I said, about 100 at a time. Uh, then there's other players, OneWeb, a British company, uh, which flies its satellites, uh, currently have nearly 500 on station. Um, I'll, I'll mention them in a minute, uh, but there were 6,000 planned. Kuiper is Amazon's version of Starlink. China Satnet is also Amaz uh, China's version of Starlink with 13,000 proposed. The one that sort of blew us all away and we didn't know whether to laugh or cry uh, was the Rwandan government filing an application to launch 327,320 satellites called Cinnamon. It's a nice name, but it's a lot of satellites, 300,000. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the application process in a minute. I don't want to send you all to sleep with bureaucracy, but you, it might give you an idea of what we're up against. So this is the scenario. Now, what's, what's led to this? Um, first of all, in terms of Starlink, uh, what's caused it is this, and I'm sure you've seen this footage before, uh, of a barge in the North Atlantic Ocean and the Falcon 9 rocket doing a perfect touchdown uh, and then being reused. So the fact that you can now reuse booster rockets as uh, SpaceX has perfected, they started doing this first in 2015, we've now seen well over 200 launches using uh, pre-used rockets. Uh, I think the record is still one uh, launch vehicle flying, it's, I think it's had its 17th launch. Uh, in the olden days, when I was a lad, you threw away your rockets. Uh, and until 2015, that's what happened. All the booster launch vehicles were 
basically left to fall back to earth and it was usually the Atlantic Ocean or somewhere similar. Uh, but this, this astonishing achievement uh, changed everything. Uh, you probably know that Elon's got a bit of a sense of humour. His two barges are called, of course I still love you. And the other one is, anybody know? Read the instructions. <laughs> and there's a third one, I can't remember what it's called. So what's, what's led this push? And this is one of them coming back to Cape Canaveral to be reused on the, on the barge. Um, first of all, as I've said there, the technology. So the effect of that, being able to bring your launch vehicle back, is to reduce the cost of launches by a factor of 10. It used to be $20,000 per kilogram to put into low Earth orbit. It's now $2,000 if you go by Starlink, via Starlink, oh sorry, via SpaceX. But the other thing, um, and you, some of you might be part of this, uh, is the demand, huge demand for communications that are essentially instantaneous. Because our long range communications used to be via geostationary orbits. And you probably know that those satellites are at 36,000 kilometers above the Earth. Um, they look at the whole hemisphere of the Earth and you send your signal up to 36,000 kilometers. It comes back about um, you know, two thirds of a second later. And that is too slow if, you've, if you are, what are you doing? Well, you're playing a game with somebody across the other side of the world on your, on your gaming console. It's too slow for that. And so that's the kind of thing that is driving this demand for what's called low latency, it means high speed internet. Um, it's also, as I've said there, been stimulated by COVID because people had to stay at home. What did they do? They played games with their friends over in Europe or wherever. Uh, and the Ukraine war, uh, that certainly stimulated the use of this. So um, let me be clear that um, I'm, not, I'm not decrying the use of this kind of facility. This is all worthwhile. This has brought the internet, certainly Starlink has, to parts of the world that never had that kind of communication. So it has a positive side in terms of its effect on humankind generally. It's just annoying for astronomers. The other thing is the legislation. So the body that lets you launch a satellite, so if you want to launch something, what do you do? You go to uh, the uh, body called the International Telecommunications Union. And what they do is allocate a frequency and an orbit for you. So they are the international brokers of orbital space. Um, and they are the only international body regulating launches. But there's no regulations around uh, orbital congestion. Um, I quite often talk to one of the senior ladies in the ITU, a lady called Veronique Lauda, and she says, um, if we got flooded with applications, the only thing that would stop us dishing them out would be the laws of physics. In other words, the spacecraft are occupying the same orbits. There's no, there's no limits about orbital congestion. She's not very happy about that, by the way. I'm not just saying that because yeah, <laughs> we, can, we can fill space. It's not like that at all. Um, once that's happened, though, um, spacecraft launches have to be uh, approved by the local legislation. And in, for example, in America, it's NASA, Federal Aviation Authority, Federal Communications Commission. They have to tick off any launch. Here in Australia, it's the Australian Communications and Media Authority and the Space Agency. So that's kind of the process. But it is really fairly straightforward. You, all you have to do is show that you think you've got the wherewithal to launch it. I don't know how Rwanda got through, to be honest, with 327,000. They operate one CubeSat, by the way, the Rwandan government. So 327,000 is quite ambitious. Anyway, um, that's, that's the process. So um, there is an element of the space industry that, uh, from which this comment comes. Take those filings with a pinch of salt. When you see numbers like that, and it's actually more now, it's gone up to nearly half a million filings. You don't faint and want to die. You basically say, okay, not all of these are going to be launched. That's what uh, this lady at Erte Holomine commented on when she was General Secretary of the Global Satellite Operators. She's actually now the, um, the Director of the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. So she's gone up in the world. So that's a point. And it's true to say 
that the space industry itself is concerned about having too much stuff in orbit because there is worry about sustainability. If you've got you know, every orbital slot filled with satellites, you're going to have collisions. And we all know about the Kessler syndrome. What happens when spacecraft collide, you get loads of debris that collides with other spacecraft, you get loads more debris, and suddenly you've got a runaway scenario which doesn't let you launch anything else. It shuts off space for humankind. So the industry's worried. Um, and it is possible, as uh, Erti Holomaini pointed out um, in a conversation, that maybe we'll find technology that will actually need, mean you, you need fewer spacecraft. <laughs> I, I raised this at a meeting um, of a body in Europe uh, at one point, said maybe we need new technology. Uh, we don't know what it is. And somebody said, yeah, it's magic, uh, which I think was a degree of cynicism about what I was saying. Uh, but there are possibilities. There are other possibilities that actually exclude magic. We haven't quite got there yet, but uh, you know, that's the sort of thing that we're looking for. Nevertheless, with all that in mind, we are probably talking about 100,000 satellites in orbit, low Earth orbit, by the end of the decade. And that means at any one time, you'll have 5,000 of them above the horizon. So that is a scenario that is uh, concerning, uh, to say the least. So what we kind of need to do really now is work out how we deal with that. And that's really the process. It's not the end of astronomy, even though my caption there suggests it is. This was the first tranche of Starlink satellites observed in the Netherlands uh, on the um, uh, 25th of May 2019 by this gentleman, Marco Langsburg, who had no idea what he was looking at. And how many have seen this taking place? Quite a lot of you. So have I. Yeah, it is quite startling, isn't it? It's yeah. in its own way. Um, enchanting. <laughs> but when you realize that, yes, you're seeing uh, 60 more satellites going up. Now, th they are here. Yeah, he, he moved his camera there. Um, but you get the drift. I, I don't need to draw the line there. It's not the end of astronomy. Uh, there's a lot of work going on to make sure it's not. Uh, here's another image showing star trails and a whole lot of Starlink spacecraft. So, uh, comment here. Um, there's quite a lot to say about this, but I won't say it because I'm just making the point. Uh, both for astronomy and, you know, no sky watchers of any kind, amateur astronomers, anybody watching the sky for whatever reason, uh, it's really important to get your satellites below naked eye brightness. That means for those of us who are astronomers in the room, below seventh magnitude, uh, visible uh, magnitude. And in fact, the rule of thumb in the space industry is if you've got a 100 kilogram spacecraft in low Earth orbit, then it's going to be visible to the naked eye. It'll be below that magnitude. Um, so you have to take steps to reduce that. And uh, I will make the comment there that they've met, met, met with uh, mixed success. SpaceX has actually taken the lead in trying to do this, this mitigation strategy uh, to bring down the brightness of their satellites when they are in their operational orbits. They can't help you seeing the, the, you know, the, the satellite train because that's when they're being inserted into their orbits. But once they get to their operational height, which is about 500 kilometers, they're working hard to make them invisible. And the, the three things that they've done, um, first of all, they said, all right, let's paint them black. Uh, but as probably most of you would know, that, that's not a good idea if you've got sunlight falling on them for half an orbit. Uh, so it did, it ruined their thermal, you know, their thermal control. And then for a while, for nearly a year and a half, they fitted them with sun visors so that the sun shades the satellite. They called them visor, visor sats. Uh, but they found that the additional area of the sun visor actually exerted drag on the spacecraft because there's still a bit of atmosphere up at 500 kilometers. So their lifetime was going to be very short. Star, uh, Starlink satellites, by the way, have a lifetime of five years. They're not long-lived satellites. They will re-enter after five years. Uh, but the <coughs> ones with the visor sats were re-entering, would have re-entered after three years. So they stopped that. What they're doing now is really clever. They're coating their spacecraft with a, what's called a dielectric film. It's a very shiny, reflective surface. And you think, what? Reflecting? We don't want that. But what they do is they make them highly reflective and then they tilt the spacecraft 
so that the beam of sunlight is reflected away from the Earth. Uh, it's a really clever way of darkening the satellites and there are <coughs> experiments in progress now. About a month ago, uh, the uh, Kuiper project, which is an Amazon project, launched two of its first two satellites, one of which had a Starlink coating on it and one of which didn't. So we'll have results quite soon about how effective those coatings are. So I think that is something that is being addressed uh, to the best of the ability of the industry. And actually, I know some of the people working at SpaceX, and they are top people. They're amateur astronomers. They're very, very keen on making this work. Um, I don't want to sound like an advert for, for Starlink or SpaceX, but the fact is that they are working very hard to deal with this and you know stop astronomers um, getting very depressed about everything. However, in telescopes, you're going to see them uh, during twilight, and especially a telescope like this. This is the Vera C. Rubin telescope, uh, which is not yet finished. It will start work, uh, we hope, uh, towards the end of next year. It's at a place called Cerro Pachon in northern Chile, and it's a wide field imaging, wide field imaging telescope, a two and a half degree field of view uh, with an 8.4 meter diameter mirror. So you've got you know, it's an astrophotographer's dream. These are image-taking instruments. And they are actually going to be the worst affected because they're the ones where the satellite trails will run across the image plane. Um, you might not know this, but up to 8% of Hubble telescope images are affected by at least one satellite trail. Uh, and then beyond that, um, there's a couple of factoids here. Uh, NASA got very worried about Generation 2 of SpaceX's Starlink project uh, in the search for potentially hazardous asteroids because often these things hide in twilight and if twilight is when you see your satellites and you've got too many satellites you can easily be misled into mixing one up with the other and that's not what you want to do especially if you've got an inbound satellite. Um, Actually, in Australian astronomy, most of what we do is spectroscopic. That's to say we're breaking the light up into its rainbow colours and looking at that barcode of information that's contained in that uh, and learning stuff from that. And they are less affected by, uh, by uh, the um, SpaceX uh, and other projects, uh, communications projects. So radio astronomy is, however, uh, at higher risk. And this strange, strange diagram is the radio spectrum. It's, the radio, it's just like a spectrum of light from violet to red. Uh, it's the radio spectrum from 300 kilohertz, kilohertz up to 300 gigahertz. Uh, and of course, radio is used for communications, for all kinds of things, for radar, sensing, lots and lots of things. So what you get is a little portion of the radio spectrum to do whatever your job is, whether it's TV broadcasts, radio broadcasts, phone communications, whatever. And so this is the way it's all chopped up. Um, you might not be able to see, but here's the color code for astronomy. Um, and there's unfortunately three yellows there, so it's hard to tell which one is which. But it's things like this that are the chunk that radio astronomers get. They get tiny little segments where are we? Radio astronomy. Tiny, tiny segments of the radio spectrum. And on either side of that, you've got people doing broadcasts, TV broadcasts or whatever. So it's very easy, even for terrestrial work, forget about the satellites, it's very easy to get leakage from broadcast frequencies into your radio astronomy frequencies. Um, I honestly don't know how my radio astronomy colleagues make it all work, but they do seem to do that. So um, it's not just, though, because of that crowded spectrum. Here's a couple of the um, ASCAP dishes, the, the, the FRB finding machine. Um, what are the other issues? Well, uh, first of all, it's day and night. It's not just during twilight. Uh, secondly, uh, what you don't want is the satellites themselves beaming their transmissions directly down into your telescope. Uh, side lobes are sort of auxiliary beams that the s satellites have. Um, because that's going to flood your receivers. And in fact, what you would like is the operators to switch off their satellites as they fly over your radio telescopes. And I'm delighted to say that that is almost certainly going to become common practice. Starlink already do it. So that there's a list of radio, astronomers, radio astronomy facilities in the world, and, or it's being built now as we speak, 
and, and the spacecraft will switch off their beams as they fly over that. However, oh well, let me just mention radar. If you've got a radar beam coming into your radio telescope, you can forget the telescope because it'll burn out the receiver. So ground uh, tracking radar is something that we really would like to see switched off as it flies over uh, an observatory. But um, this is an issue that it's hard for any of the operators to deal with at the moment. And that is that the satellites themselves, even when they're not broadcasting downwards, for example, as they're passing over a radio observatory, they are bright in the radio spectrum because they're, they're noisy. They've got leaky electronics that leak out. And these radio telescopes are so sensitive that they can see just the leaky electronics on board a spacecraft. I didn't tell you how sensitive they are. The square kilometer array will be capable of spotting a, um, a, 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 an, air, an airport radar at 50 light years. So that's quite sensitive. Could, it could pick up a mobile phone on Mars. You know, that's the sort of thing that we're talking about. So imagine a noisy, an electronically noisy spacecraft flying overhead. They're going to see it and it will interfere. And it does. And actually, the latest is the ion thrusters, the thrusters that they use to control the, the attitude and direction of the spacecraft are also electronically noisy. Unbelievably, there are some satellites that are not registered with the ITU. There are pirate satellites, and they're a problem too. And then, quite sort of almost comically, there's reflection of FM radio stations from hundreds of kilometers away, reflecting off the satellites and coming back into your radio telescope. Uh, that's actually being twisted around so that you can use that as a kind of passive radar and you can make measurements that tell you how high the spacecraft is and how big it is. But that's not what you want. You don't want any of these FM radio signals uh, with some jolly music coming through your satellite uh, when you're trying to detect something at 8 billion light years away. It's not really very nice. So what are astronomers doing? Well, as I said there, they grumbled a lot to start with. I do think... Um, and I'm part of this as a lifelong astronomer. Um, I think we've had a sense of entitlement about the night sky. We've, you know, we've been the owners of the night sky for 400 years since the invention of the telescope. Uh, and astronomers have, have felt that, they, you know, that it was their province. And suddenly now we've got something else coming along that wants to use the night sky. Uh, and we're a bit upset, and I am too. Um, so th this is not really something that you should dwell on. This is just a list of the kind of actions and activities that have been taken. Many, many workshops, conferences. Um, the most recent, which I was at, was in La Palma in the Canary Islands uh, last month. Uh, and IAU, IAU is the International Astronomical Union uh, Symposium. Uh, so that, uh, that's sort of the kind of level that the astronomers are working at to get this problem licked. Um, I mentioned there, I guess this is the highest level of all these things. COPWAS is the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. STSC is their scientific and technical subcommittee. And they have a dark and quiet skies agenda item for the last two years. Um, and I've had quite a lot to... to yes, it's the UN. Please answer it. It's the UN. It's important. <laughs> it's all right. Don't worry. No, don't worry at all. Um, this is the UN back in February in Vienna um, with somebody who looks a lot like me giving Australia's statement on, the, uh, on, the, on our attitude to dark and quiet skies. Uh, so you can see that the action and activity is at a high level. Um, but what do astronomers want? What do we want? Moderate change. When do we want it? In due course. It's, it's kind of I quite like it now if we can have it. But that's the bottom line. What do we want? And so um, quite a lot has happened. First of all, reduce satellite reflectivity. That would be great, and that's happening. Uh, as I said, with Star Starlink. Uh, but this diagram gives you an idea why you would want to operate, you want the operators to bring the satellites lower rather than pushing them up higher. And that's because the lower the spacecraft are, the shorter the time that they're illuminated in twilight. And that's what the diagram's all about. So if you spacecraft are at a thousand kilometers, you can see them all night at certain latitudes. If they're at 500 kilometers, then you don't. You see them for an hour before twilight and, or after twilight and an hour before dawn. Um, that's highly latitude dependent. If you're in Canada, 
you kind of get them all the time uh, in the summertime, for example, because of the northerly latitudes. But once again, Starlink very quickly, sorry, SpaceX very quickly came to the party on that. They were originally planning to have shells of orbits at 1200 kilometers. And they canned that when they realized the damage that that would do uh, to astronomical observations. Avoid direct, direct, not directly illuminating radio observatories. They're already doing that. As I said, that's something that is spreading throughout the industry and we'll almost certainly see regulation on that. Comply with what the International Telecommunications Union tells you to do in terms of the frequencies that you can use because some don't. Some operators actually just turn up the wick a bit because they want a bit more signal coming down to the ground. So that's uh, compliance is important. And overall better regulation because at the moment there's none relating to optical astronomy uh, and it's pretty limited for radio. Um, and provide accurate positions. If we knew the accurate positions of satellites and you knew that a satellite was going to go through the field of view of your telescope, you can close the shutter or something of that sort while it's passing through. That's actually quite a problem because the operators themselves don't always know the most accurate positions for their, for their satellites. And it's true that both optical and radio astronomers are developing workarounds, pre and post observation strategies. Uh, so for example, there's now software that lets you take out a satellite trail and if it's faint enough, uh, then it won't have spread light into adjacent pixels on your image. So that's being perfected effectively uh, by amateur astronomers as well as the professional astronomy community. So um, Australia's position is a slightly delicate one, um, which is why I never get a straight answer from the Australian Space Agency, uh, although I'm working with them. You see, uh, space is all about making money. Uh, it's about commercial activity and certainly the Australian Space Agency is a very, very industry orientated one. And the last thing they want to do is to, you know, um, essentially irritate all their operators uh, by siding with the astronomers. On the other hand, they've got um, many, probably two or three, no, it's more than that, it's probably half a billion dollars worth of astronomical infrastructure with the square kilometre array, the, all the Narrabri radio telescopes, the optical telescopes, a lot of infrastructure that's been supported by the Australian government already and possibly more. So they've got to support the astronomers. So they're treading a fine line. But as it says there, that's a very bland statement. It comes from uh, what I was uh, saying to the UN. Um, it, it's, uh, the, we support all the efforts of the industry to build bridges between all stakeholders, continue research and disseminate resources. It's a motherhood statement. But underneath that, there's a lot of really good work going on. Um, and in particular, the International Astronomical Union uh, has kicked off uh, this thing which is called <laughs> it's called the International Astronomical Union Centre for the Protection of the Dark and Quiet Sky from Satellite Constellation Interference. But we usually just call it the CPS because it's just too long. Uh, so that centre um, basically is, uh, is jointly operated by the Square Kilometre Array Observatory which I forgot to mention is actually governed from the UK, even though it's an international body. Two telescopes, one in South Africa, one in, uh, in Western Australia, but a headquarters in Manchester, actually, at Jodrell Bank. Um, so they uh, put in a bid along with the American Noir Lab uh, uh, consortium. Noir Lab is the National Optical and Infrared Laboratory, and it's the, uh, it's the national, basically, uh, body that governs the optical, the visible light astronomy uh, facilities in America. So they jointly host this uh, CPS and they kicked off in April last year and they're doing a great job. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute when I wind up. Uh, but there are other things happening. So uh, NSF, the National Science Foundation, which operates the Noir Lab, they've signed an agreement with SpaceX to mitigate the impact of Starlink satellites. Uh, there's a lot of very good work, so they're, they're working together on this. Uh, the CSIRO in Australia, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, is also working uh, with SpaceX. So these are really positive steps. And I hope the picture I'm painting here tells you that whilst it would be really nice if we didn't have to do all this, uh, we have to do it because the world is progressing, but there are uh, many, you know, things in place which we hope will, will reduce the effect 
of these satellites on astronomy. And I think too, personally, this is a cartoon rather than a real picture, uh, but it's one of these satellite trains. I think there are opportunities for us uh, to learn or to use these, uh, these effects. Uh, for example, in astronomy outreach, um, people see these things, people not like you who know what's going on in the sky. They're people who have no idea what this row of blobs in the sky is, which sometimes just looks like a straight line. It's quite a mysterious thing to see. Um, and they, you know, is it alien warfare? Is it um, some supernatural being arriving? What is it? Um, and they're keen to know. And I, so I think there are outreach opportunities for, for astronomers there. And they do. They understand what the consequences are for astronomers. And more than that, um, the CPS, the IAU Centre, is really keen to communicate with any science communicators or amateur astronomers of any kind uh, to sort of feed their inputs because not only are they working on the technologies for reducing the effect of these spacecraft, they're also working on policies, they are lobbying governments, they're working with the UN uh, to try and set a framework where this will all be healed to some extent. Um, there is another body called the Space Sustainability Rating Association which I'm now kind of on the edge of, where operators of satellites get tick marks for how, sustain how sustainable their operation is. And we're just building a module to put dark and quiet skies into that so that you can get, you know, gold or platinum status if you keep your satellites dark and don't swamp the Earth with radio signals. So my closing message here uh, is that astronomy won't be the same in the era of mega constellations, but it will keep going. It's not the end of astronomy. We have a future. We have some wonderful telescopes coming on stream. We've got research, uh, which I haven't really talked about too much, but I'm happy to answer questions on that uh, if you'd like. Uh, that's, that's unfolding the universe for us in so many ways. Um, and one other thing is that dark and quiet locations are vitally important. So dark sky parks, dark sky, sorry, dark sky reserves, the kinds of things that you have here in New Zealand and we have in Australia are vitally important and we support them wholeheartedly in the world of astronomy. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. All so much. It's not all doom and gloom. It's all right. <laughs> so, is laser communication likely to be a big improvement in the radio noise and not bring its own problems? Yeah, that's right. So, um, most of the operators are currently testing laser communications on their spacecraft. Um, at the moment, Starlink are using it for spacecraft to spacecraft communication. But um, to, to beam it down to the Earth brings new problems uh, because these are typically infrared. And I think this is a technology that's in its infancy. I'm not sure how far it's going to go. Of course, laser communications offer you much higher bandwidths. You can squeeze a lot more data into your signal. Um, so it remains to be seen how that will be. I haven't seen any uh, reports of observations by astronomers of laser sources in orbit yet. <laughs> uh, so I don't think there are any, but yeah, it, it's, a, it, it's another thing to worry about. Uh, my guess is it will turn out to be not as critical as some of the things we're already facing, but that remains to be seen. You can te test me again in a year. <laughs> I've got a question about the frequency that Starlink are using. So the primary frequency is is that a direct issue with radio astronomy or is it more the side bands that they're emitting? Um, one of their frequencies, uh, and I'm not being a radio astronomer, I can't quote it, but it is a specific frequency that they use which actually interferes with one of the astronomy wave bands. I think the problem is it, it's right next to one of the dedicated astronomy um, frequency bands. And so leakage is a problem. But the, you know, the, 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 certainly the radio astronomers at first were very worried about this particular. It's in the mid-frequency part of the spectrum. I think it's somewhere in the region of 12, 12 uh, gigahertz. The, which is not, you know, we think of 
So cold hydrogen, for example, emits at, what is it, 12, 1227 or something uh, megahertz, which is much lower frequencies. And that's not where these signals from any of the operators come in. Uh, so low frequency is a little bit better off, apart from the, the glowing of the spacecraft itself in radio waves. Um, I, I should be able to give you a better answer that, to that, Bill, but because I did look up all this quite some time ago, but there's a lot of numbers involved, and I can't remember what they are. One of the frequencies, though, is very near to an astronomical one. Somebody mentioned a cup of tea there. Are there any online questions at all, Steve? No. In that case, we will adjourn and like to thank Sounds great. Thank you. Professor Watson. Uh, small gift. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you've, sh you've showered me with gifts already. Gosh. <laughs> Oh, thank you thank so you much. For, uh, well, thank you for an excellent and informative talk. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.